Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for joining us today. I'm Ben Stone, Director of Arts and Culture with Smart Growth America and Transportation for America. Thanks again for being here for our relaunch of the Scenic Route website. Um, we have a bunch of great folks who are joining us today. Um, you can see their names on the screen here. I'll allow them to introduce themselves as they get called up one by one. I just wanted to start with a quick introduction to our organization and let you know why it is we're coming together to, to relaunch this website before we jump into everyone's presentations. So really quickly, I'm sure many of you, hopefully all of you joining this webinar today are familiar with Smart Growth America and Transportation for America. We are the enemies of Euclidean zoning. We're the champions of transit and density. We're leaders of the smart growth movement around the country. We're a national organization based in Washington, D.C., though many of us, including myself, are scattered around the country. I myself am in Oakland, California. And we have staff in many different parts of the city, or in many different parts of the country, excuse me. <clears throat> we also, um, as of about five years, almost exactly five years ago, have launched an arts and culture team, which of course is focused on bringing arts and culture into the work of Smart Growth America and Transportation for America. And as you can see on the screen here, and as you may have heard in past webinars about many of our other projects, we work in a number of different ways. One, we often fund projects. We put money into transportation, usually transportation related projects to bring artists and creative workers into those projects to help solve problems. We track the work that's happening all over the country. We write about it. We write reports. You'll see on the screen there, the field scan that we completed with ArtPlace. And then finally, we train practitioners much like all of you on this call today. We often do what I call a Arts 101 for the transportation sector and a Transportation 101 for artists and arts administrators, knowing that these folks often work together, but often struggle to speak the same language, understand the same timelines and budgets and things of that nature. So we often bring folks together in a room like that. We're now in the virtual environment these days. Um, there's a lot more I can say. I want to tell you a little bit about why we created the scenic route in the first place, why we've updated it, what it includes. I'm going to do a short walkthrough of all the different components of the site. But for now, I'm going to hand things off to Jen Hughes from the NEA to help us introduce our webinar today. Jen, take it away. Hi, thank you so much. Um, really honored to be here. Thank you, Ben. Thank you to Smart Growth America and Transportation for America. And really honored to be here with an amazing group of panelists. And I wanted to really start off and just share um, how inspired the scenic route has been for the folks and constituents we serve across the country as the National Endowment for the Arts. And also for all of you, just to introduce you to us as a federal agency, to also introduce our funding opportunities and give you a little sense for what we've been funding at the nexus of creative placemaking. And we'll talk a little bit about that. So just to give context about who I am, um, I have been actually with the National Endowment for the Arts, which we call the NEA, I'm sure you'll hear me using that throughout my presentation, for roughly a decade. I'm trained as an urban planner, so I'm particularly passionate about this intersection of arts and culture and transportation. So if we go to the next slide, I'll just share a little bit about the National Endowment for the Arts. Um, we, are, uh, we were established by Congress in 1965 as an independent federal agency. We receive our allocation annually from Congress. Our FY21 budget is roughly $170 million a year. And we primarily do grant making all across the country. So I really want you to think of us as an agency as you're getting your arts and transportation projects underway as a funding resource um, to really tap as you're looking to do your work locally. We also have partnerships. Um, while the NEA is based in Washington, D.C., we work with states and regional arts organizations, uh, philanthropy as well. So as you are creatively conceiving of really exciting initiatives, I would encourage you to also think about them as funders. We also conduct a whole series of research um, on the impact of the arts. Uh, we've done a lot of work in the past years investing really in creative placemaking, what we like to call this nexus of arts and community development, arts and transportation, arts and public health, et cetera. And then lastly, we run national initiatives. Uh, some of you may be familiar with our Mayor's Institute on City Design program, um, which really is about training mayors as the chief urban designers in their uh, cities. So, if your mayor hasn't participated in that program, we'd love to hear from you. Uh, so please certainly be in touch. 
And lastly, just want to encourage you to take a look at all that we do. We have all of our funding opportunities um, listed on this link here that I see was also dropped into the chat box. Um, so please, please peruse. Okay, the next slide, please. As I mentioned, um, you know, as you're thinking about funding and sort of getting some of these great project ideas off the ground, I would just encourage you to look to your state arts agencies. 40% of our funding at the national level goes directly to state arts agencies, as well as six regional arts agencies. And these are great sources for supporting your work, um, perhaps even matching some of the federal funding that is available and accessible. On the next slide, 60% um, of our funding goes directly out the door in competitive grants. So if you are a nonprofit 501c3, a government entity, or a federally recognized tribal government, you are eligible to come in for funding from the NEA. You do not have to be an arts and culture organization, but you do have to be putting forth a project that is really at the nexus of arts, culture, or design. So we have four funding categories. I'm really gonna to speak to you all about our town today briefly because that is our creative placemaking grant program um, that really well situates and supports projects at this really exciting nexus of arts and transportation. But please know we have annual deadlines a year in February and July for our grants for arts projects category. Challenge America is annually in April. Our town, um, we'll talk about in a moment, with a deadline in August, as well as research grants. And I just like to lift up that we fund projects. So one to two year projects, we do require a one-to-one -one cost share match, but that can certainly be made up with in-kind resources. Okay, on the next slide, we're gonna really get into it. Um, when the we talk about creative placemaking at the NEA, the grant program that funds that work is Our Town. And our definition here is intentionally broad and open. Um, it is the integration of arts, culture, and design to strengthen community with a goal of helping achieve a community's desired outcome. So um, based on this theme today of arts and transportation, perhaps that is really increasing safe streets or connecting communities uh, through pedestrian bike routes or transit. So think about what the role of arts and culture can really play in advancing some of those transportation related goals. So in our town, we'd like to talk about sort of the key tenets of the program. Projects are asset based, so really recognizing what's unique in a place, what can you capitalize and expand on. Um, all of our communities across the, across the country have artists within them and really incredible culture bearers who carry on a uh, really important legacy of work in their communities. Um, when we are also funding cross-sector partnerships, so in the Our Town program, um, that could look like uh, a nonprofit arts organization in partnership with the Transit Authority or the local Department of Transportation partnering with any number of nonprofit organizations and community. You all know this probably quite well that for place-based projects to be successful, there has to be really deep community engagement. Uh, that is a tenant of the Art Town program. And being the National Down for the Arts, we uh, like to really center artists, designers, and culture bearers as advancing these initiatives. So within the Art Town program and framework, we are really talking about projects that are laying the groundwork for systems change. So meaning uh, sustained integration of arts and culture and design into every phase of community development, or perhaps you just replace that into every phase of transportation. So um, this is really what we're funding and looking to support in the Our Town program. And we hope you uh, tee up some great projects for us in the coming year. So on the next slide, I just wanna really emphasize um, you know, certainly when folks think about arts and culture, oftentimes they think about an, arch uh, an artifact, so a piece of public art, or they might actually think about um, an arts institution. But what we are really funding and seeing all across the country in the Our Town program is that the projects that we are funding don't need to result in a physical ar artifact. Um, we're really talking about transformational change, not transactional. 
So we have a lot of great examples up on our website. I would encourage you to take a look at our impact page, Creative Placemaking, but more importantly, really to seek that inspiration from the scenic route. There are so many incredible case studies about the ways in which artists, designers, and culture bearers are partnering at this nexus of transportation to do some really meaningful work that is in fact transformational in community. I also always like to lift up, particularly for an audience like this, when we are talking about um, why would you want to engage artists, designers, and culture bearers? Uh, we at the NEA recognize that they are uniquely positioned to illuminate, bringing new attention or elevating key community assets, issues, histories, people, places. They also have the ability to really energize the community, injecting new energy and enthusiasm into a place or a community issue. Um, they are very skilled connectors, um, connecting communities, peoples, places. And lastly, they really help to imagine um, new futures and new possibilities for a place and galvanizing the community in the work that they do. So I just want to leave you with uh, this timeline to keep on your radar um, as you go forth in the work that you're stewarding locally. Draw on those wonderful examples um, and the training opportunities from Smart Growth America. We've been so inspired in how they've lifted up such great and important work. And that is really on the cutting edge of this field in kind of advancing transportation oriented outcomes and goals uh, locally. And keep an eye on our application deadline. We'll be releasing the grant guidelines soon at arts.gov. Um, so we would welcome and encourage you all to apply, to be in touch. We're happy to point you to some great project examples or really to uh, discuss your application proposal. And lastly, I think it's important to lift up in this time on our last slide here that I have before I hand it over um, that the National Endowment for the Arts um, as part of the Biden-Harris administration is really lifting up these key priorities. First and foremost, recognizing the need to really rebuild and recover the creative economy, um, the arts and cultural community that's been really suffering throughout the pandemic. Um, be thinking about how arts and culture is really uniquely positioned to help heal the nation um, in our recovery from this, this period of time. And lastly, um, very focused on advancing racial equity, access and climate justice, something that I know is on top of mind for many of you in the audience. Um, so we're really aligned in hoping to facilitate and support projects that are squarely in that space. And lastly, I'm sure you're all tracking um, sort of first and foremost, the American Rescue Plan. I know the CARES Act that is still underway in distribution, um, but to sort of keep that on your radar and be really thinking about the ways that artists, designers and culture bearers can really be integrated into a lot of the project work that I imagine your community is going to be responding with locally as these dollars flow out the door. And feel free to be in touch with us at the NEA. I'll drop my email address in the chat and um, hope to hear more for, from you. And next, I think I'm gonna turn it back over to Ben to introduce uh, the panel. It's a real honor to be with you all and hope you'll be in touch. Thanks so much, Jen. Appreciate that introduction. Um, really glad Jen was able to be here to join us today to share all of that with all of you uh, for a couple of reasons. One, it's a little bit disingenuous to share a bunch of great ideas about how to involve artists and in transportation projects without also talking about some opportunities to fund that work, of course. Though there are, of course, other ways to fund besides the NEA. Many of the projects that are in the scenic route that we'll talk about today have received NEA funding. And perhaps most importantly, the scenic route itself was actually funded by the NEA. So thank you, Jen. Thank you, the NEA, for that. Um, before I jump in to the bulk of our presentation today, just a couple of quick housekeeping things you probably see in the chat. Hopefully, you're all looking at the chat. A lot of the links that Jen just shared are appearing there, so you can click on those. Um, the number one most asked question with any webinar we do is, will this be recorded? Will the slides be shared afterwards? And I can say yes to both, so you'll have both of those in your inbox soon. And then also wanted to point out that we're using a live transcription service called Otter. So if that is of use to you and you'd like a live transcription of what we're all saying as we say it, you can click on the link and follow along there as well. Um, and finally, last, last bit of housekeeping. 
we'd love to hear your questions and comments, so feel free to share those, and we will do our best to save some time at the end. And the chance that we don't have time at the end, which of course is often a possibility with this many people presenting, we will share answers to your questions over email and when we post this video at the end. So I'm gonna jump in with the bulk of our presentation focused on, of course, the scenic route. And I wanna just start by saying that the scenic route actually launched almost exactly five years ago, five years and three or four months ago, I suppose at this point, with funding from the Kresge Foundation. And the reason we wanted to go back and do an, a full update of the website is for, for a few reasons. One, there's just so many more case studies out there, so many good exem exemplary projects out there that we wanted to highlight. This work, the creative placemaking field was at an early stage five plus years ago. We wanted to make sure we highlighted some really great projects that brought in issues of equity to the work they're doing as well and highlighted different corners of the country. Two, we wanted to make the website really practical for people who maybe have gone beyond the quote unquote creative placemaking 1.0. They've uh, caught the bug, so to speak. They're interested in doing the work and now they really wanna know the practical, how do you do this kind of information. And then finally three, Smart Growth America itself was not deeply engaged in this work back when the scenic route launched. And now we are, and so we've highlighted a lot of our own work and talked about things that we've been engaged with directly. And then finally, far less importantly, we were able to snag the great URL transportation.art that you see on your screen there. So that's where you can find the scenic route. Hopefully you all have seen it already. Um, I, I personally just love if you look up transportation.art, Google seems to think that of course, if you combine transportation and art, they must be talking about preschool and toddlers. Maybe we'll get funded to do something at that intersection in the future, but I can assure you this is very much a site for adults, much like all of you professionals working at this intersection. This is what the website looks like, Scenic Route Guide to Arts, Culture, and Transportation. Um, and this website is really based in many ways on the work we've done in the past with ArtPlace. And hopefully many of you have seen these. We have uh, some animated GIF versions of all these on the site as well. We spent about a year, my staff and I at Smart Growth America, looking at all the different ways that artists have already been involved in transportation projects, identified a bunch of different challenges that artists address and the ways in which they help. These are sort of the, the ways that artists help is how we describe it on, on the website. We've actually added an eighth version related to the COVID pandemic you can find on the website too. So you're all smart people and you're all very capable of uh, finding your way through a easy to navigate website, but I do wanna just showcase what is actually included here. We have a whole start here section. This is where the bulk of the, um, the arguments for doing this kind of work are featured. Why you'd wanna do this, how you can do this, what some of the pitfalls are that you might wanna avoid, and really the step-by-step -step process for getting involved as a transportation professional working with artists and arts organizations. Two, how artists help. That goes back to that animation uh, section I just showed, the illustration section I just showed all these different ways, including mitigating the impacts of the COVID-19 pandemic is also featured there. Much of our own work and some other agencies' work is highlighted there as individual case studies with lots of lessons to be learned from those projects. We have a whole section on case studies I'll get to in just a moment. Um, I mentioned that SGA's projects are now featured here. This is really the bulk of the work that we've done in the last five years at this intersection of arts, culture, and transportation. And so I wanna just jump into the first section. This is sort of the uh, the slightly more academic part of the site. This is where you can find lots of writing, um, interviews with people working on these topics. And we have a, a whole section that is also um, devoted to, again, one of the most asked questions that I get when I go around, or used to go around and, and give talks in places and work with different cities, which is, how do I find an artist? I, I'm convinced this makes sense to do this work. I work for a DOT, I work for a transit agency. I'm sold on the benefits of working with an artist, but where do I find an artist and what different kinds of artists are out there? So this is really an attempt to explain the fact that not, not all artists are the same. Some artists are really studio artists. They might paint an easel, they might work at a computer. Inviting them to run a meeting for you or to work in the public realm probably doesn't make sense if they haven't done that or not interested in doing that. There's lots of artists that work publicly. Sorry, so social practice, civic practice. Um, encourage you all to explore this section more and especially the section on where you can find an artist and contracting with an artist. We find this is often a stumbling block, again, with people who have caught the bug and are interested in doing this work, don't quite know exactly where to start. And the great news is that almost every community in America at some scale has an arts council, arts nonprofit, some uh, team you can partner with 
and Kara, who you'll hear from in a minute, uh, represents one of those who can really fill that role and help you sort out some of those nitty gritty details on working with, with artists. Um, apologies to the great artists we've worked with in the past. Um, Indo VC Okoye, who had his head chopped off there. Sorry about that, Indo VC. Um, so we also wanted to include, this is something that I anecdotally have done for a number of years, but wanted to include some interviews with people working at this intersection, artists and DOT staff and engineers and planners, and there's far more. If you actually are on the website, you can scroll through this whole section. These uh, the short paragraphs are really the language that people use to convince their superiors, elected officials, appointed officials, funders, that this intersectional work makes sense and that should be supported. So if you're looking to convince somebody to take this work seriously, have them watch this webinar. Hopefully that'll help have them go to transportation.art, but also have them look through this list or use some of the advice and some of the, the terms and language used here to convince people to take you seriously. Um, we also wanted to double down on our what could go wrong section, not to scare anyone off, but recognizing that good things that are brought to communities often have quote unquote unintended consequences. I don't really believe in unintended consequences. I believe in not expanding one's scope far enough to actually um, account for all consequences that can happen from the work you do. But this is really a section that talks about how to avoid doing things you probably don't want to do, like pushing displacement or having projects not loved and supported by the community. So I encourage you all to look at that section as well. There's plenty more in there, but I won't go into all that for now. So again, the bulk of this section is this how artists help section, where you'll find um, eight of these different sections. This is number two, making streets safer for all users. Road safety is increasingly important these days as roads become more and more dangerous year after year. And the way this is organized is, I go back, um, around the illustration that we've created in the past and identifying how artists help, really spelling out the challenge, uh, how can street design and related policies be more responsive for all users, and a solution that we think artists are uniquely positioned to play to address that challenge. So again, eight sections there, each spelled out with a specific challenge we've heard from the transportation sector, and then a solution that can be contributed to by the arts sector. And then under each of those sections, you'll find case studies. But you can also go straight to the case study section if you know what you're looking for and find several dozen case studies featured. You can search by mode if you are really concerned about streets or transit or even ferries. I think there's one ferry project up there. We'd love to get some more up there. You can look again by these approaches. And then you can also search by location if you just want to find something in your, your home state. So this is what the transit section looks like. Lots of projects are featured in more than one section here. Great state of Tennessee has quite a few projects, some of which we've been involved in, some of which we've just tracked from the outside. And then again, back to that making streets safer for all users, quite a few projects it's highlighted around the country in that section. And so what does a case study actually look like? Um, I'll just quickly look at our, our own project, the Washington State Department of Transportation Artists in Residence program we ran about a year ago with two artists. In each of these sections, you'll find some photographs, you'll find the um, specific solution or approach that is being addressed here. You'll find other case studies that are related, so you can find uh, another example, maybe from a larger community or a smaller community, or if the state example doesn't make sense, you can find a municipal level example, perhaps. And then again, back to the challenge for this specific project. And if you were able to scroll down on the screen here, you would see how the artist contributed to a solution to that challenge, as well as some lessons learned from this specific project. Our own section, not to be too self-referential, we did want to highlight what we ourselves have done. You'll find um, our state DOT arts and residence program, the rapid response work we've been doing to mitigate the COVID pandemic, a cultural corridor consortium program we ran for a number of years, transportation training we, we did with support of the NEA as well, fellowship program, field scan, there's more and I won't waste your time with going through all of them. Um, that's my contact information. I think you all have it already. Um, I'm gonna come back at the end and just share a little bit to close out, but that is sort of a quick walk through the resources section. Um, that is really where you can go to find more information about funding, about connections to other nonprofits and organizations doing similar work. There's a whole network of people out there besides just Transportation for America and Smart Growth America with lots of great websites, lots of great research resources, um, PDFs you can download to find more information too. So I encourage you to check that out as well. 
Um, I'm really excited today that we have a couple people, three people, I should say, highlighting two different projects that are featured on our website along with many, many others. Um, we're going to start with Jason Foster, who's going to share a project that um, we had nothing to do with. I won't take credit for Destination Crenshaw. It is a great project. Love to talk it up, but excited to actually hand it off to the person who is responsible, along with lots of other folks, I'm sure, um, for doing this great work in Los Angeles. With that, Jason, I'll hand it off to you. Cool, cool. Thanks, man. Um, you know, it's really great to to be here and to really be talking about the intersection of arts and culture and, and transportation development. Uh, coming to you from Los Angeles, uh, we, we have a significant pipeline of public investment uh, and infrastructure projects that will kind of dictate how our community in Los Angeles continues to evolve. Um, and, and there are actually concerns around these significant developments and what they mean for community. Um, and, and one of the things I want to lift up out of this conversation is just, you know, how Destination Crenshaw and, and specifically the Crenshaw community chose art and culture as a way to mitigate some of those concerns and, and really work towards a, a future that involves everyone uh, in the community, uh, kind of led by artists um, that, that are from and grounded from the community. So next slide. Um, I'll be talking about, you know, the overview of the project, of course, but really kind of how design and community engagement meet, um, and then how arts and community revitalization kind of are a focal point of what we do. Uh, I'll specifically break down how we actually work with artists, how, how we factor them into our project, um, explain a little bit about the difference between permanent and temporary murals uh, with changing communities, uh, digital opportunities that we really want to focus on our, our young and early artists as well. Um, and then how we're looking at this project is COVID response. You know, it is a, a, a product of the times um, and we need to be thinking about workforce development and creative career opportunities for our artists uh, as we move forward. Uh, next slide. So, so the genesis of our project is, is really from uh, LA Metro um, and their construction of the LAX uh, Crenshaw line, uh, this light rail line that was actually going to be built uh, through the Crenshaw community. Um, so there was a $2 billion investment uh, taking people uh, through public transportation from mid-city Los Angeles through South LA uh, to LAX, our, our major airport. Um, and this investment um, was was actually created in 2011, um, and and the South LA residents weren't even going to have a stop when it was first created. So like, let's start there, right? With transportation equity, the conversation where it is right now, where it was, uh, you know, we were using uh, some of these uh, kind of underserved communities as thoroughfares. Um, and that's a lot of what the communication around, you know, righting the wrongs of inequities that that have happened through infrastructure, you know, that's what we're doing today. Um, and, and so when the community was actually able to get a stop uh, in the Crenshaw community, the decision was actually be made uh, to, to have this train line go at grade. Um, so there's a 1.3 mile section of the Crenshaw corridor. And there's a video here um, that would show this kind of corridor. Um, you know, it, it was actually decided to be at grade, and so for the 43 businesses that are along this corridor, um, the low-rise housing to the east and the west of this corridor, um, they had 400 trees that were taken out because of this construction, 300 parking spaces that were taken out, um, and, you know, it was devastating for not only the residents, but uh, the small business owners that are along this corridor, and, and little did you know, the, the infrastructure folks know that this is the largest intact black community um, on west of Chicago uh, for, for the amount of black people that are in an intact community. And it was the largest black business corridor on the West Coast. Um, so it was a true linchpin of the South LA community. Um, and to have this actually happen to them, uh, it was devastating. Uh, next slide. So the community members stood up. They said, what can we do about this? Um, so the LA City Council member now, uh, Marquise Harris Dawson, who represents Council District 8, uh, he was a community leader back then. Uh, and he was leading an organization called Community Coalition. Um, and they started a campaign 
around how do we take uh, control of this situation and really make sure the community is actually seen uh, through this process because there was actually no way to stop the train's construction. Um, so they led years um, of community charrettes, uh, house parties, uh, salons, uh, and community engagement events to really think about how they could focus their efforts to make lemonade out of the lemons uh, that this community was given. Um, and the areas of focus were economic development. How do we support these businesses that are along the corridor to make sure that even before COVID, even before the social injustice, uh, the two pandemics that we had, the black community in LA was already having issues, right? Like we were already needing resilience uh, to be our backbone. Um, and then how do we have arts and culture play a part in this, right? This conversation today, how do we lift up the artists in the community and understand that the cultural capital of South LA is actually LA's largest export. Uh, black culture actually drives what happens not only in Los Angeles, but the world. Um, and how do we capture more of that impact to make sure that our community is actually uh, benefiting from the change? And then how do we actually have storytelling that connects intergenerational exchange, right? Like how do we improve in the black community, but also tell the story of the past and acknowledge the present, right? Because I feel like being able to do that will be able to actually solve some of these gentrification displacement concerns because we are acknowledging people and providing them an opportunity to heal through storytelling. Next slide. So what the community members came up with is Destination Crenshaw. Uh, Destination Crenshaw is a 1.3 mile cultural infrastructure project really tying together a few things. Uh, economic investment um, and strategic urban planning, making sure that we are able to, you know, kind of build the revitalized community um, that this community deserves. Uh, we will have 10 pocket parks along the corridor there will be hundreds of newly planted trees 822 to be exact um, and over 100 uh, commission works of art next slide and throughout this corridor like you see here um, it will be 1.3 miles like i said 2.6 miles of continuous streetscape um, and what's exciting about this is an opportunity to have a vibrant community that has, you know, your street, um, your bikeable lanes, uh, but also your, your programming spaces. Uh, the outlines that you see here um, are the pocket parks that are along the corridor. Um, there will also be an exhibition and design component that actually curates the entire experience of the corridor. Uh, we have four themes currently, improvisations, first, dreams, and togetherness. In these places, our wayfinding signage, our arts uh, commissions, as well as the exhibition uh, will all work together to be able to tell a thematic story of what the corridor is and tie in our small businesses and residents to that as well. Next slide. So how does all this come together? Obviously we had artists in the room, right? <laughs> like being able to create a system where it, 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 it works so seamlessly and it feels like a curated experience throughout the corridor, we made sure that we were bringing artists into this conversation. And two of these pictures really shows, uh, you know, how we had curated experiences around uh, the project's development and how we brought artists to the table. And we wanted to use art as a way to fight against some of the gentrification and culture erasure that takes place in some of these large infrastructure projects. And personally, I feel like having artists and community members in the infrastructure conversation is actually having them at the highest levels of privilege. They're determining how their community lives and moves within space um, and how we interact with each other. Uh, and I believe that that is the opportunity of having more artists and arts and culture in our infrastructure conversations. Next slide. So now I wanna talk about specifically how we manage uh, over 100 public arts commissions through this process. Um, and I talked earlier about how the, um, how the public infrastructure investment uh, was very vast in LA and LA County. Um, each one of those investments has a 1% for the arts designation. Um, so out of that 30 billion, there's a lot of money for public art. Um, and we feel like this is an opportunity to actually grow the Public Arts Commission's pipeline for our Black artists from the Crenshaw community. Um, so the cultural, um, the, the Community Advisory Council came together and actually devised a curatorial process for how this would happen. 
Um, so we had people on our engagement crew come together, create a process for not only reviewing um, new uh, proposals for each of these art opportunities, but to actually make sure that they were being developed along the way. Um, and, and to limit the barriers for what artists actually have to go through to land one of these commissions. Because we feel like socializing and providing access to the opportunity is just important as getting the opportunity. Because we want to create careers for the creative economy and we want to create opportunities for people in the future to participate in this. Next slide. So this curatorial uh, committee is actually led by Dr. Joy Simmons, uh, who is our senior arts and exhibition advisor. And these are some of our curatorial members uh, right here. They actually um, have sent out several open RFPs, everything from permanent pieces to temporary art to uh, digital art uh, that currently goes up on our mini murals on our construction fences on the site. Next slide. So throughout the process, like I said, there's over a hundred different art opportunities along the corridor. Uh, we focused on three main components. Uh, we have cultural infrastructure. These are things that are tied into the parking, uh, to the pocket parks um, and have been identified by our design firm at Perkins and Will. Uh, there are nine 3D permanent opportunities that we'll be having. These are sculptures and 3D pieces um, that will really kind of speak to the monumentality uh, that a lot of people are experiencing right now. Uh, this is something that the Destination Crenshaw Project has been talking about uh, for, for three to four years now. Um, so we think that is an opportunity for us to really show how uh, the Black Monument can evolve uh, and be seen in urban space. And then there's 200 or some odd, or 100 some odd opportunities for uh, 2D murals. Um, and these are temporary opportunities on land, uh, land owners or business owners' properties. Um, and we currently work through a letter of intent process where we talk to each specific uh, business owner and actually present them with different opportunities that we feel like the artist and the business owner could work together on. Next slide. And this just shows um, how we actually go about identifying these different places. It is very, is very um, specific uh, to each opportunity. Um, so we, we work with our architect architecture firm, uh, Perkins and Will, like I said, and the curatorial team, and really look at each building and the different opportunities uh, and present this to business owners um, as something uh, that they could potentially participate in. Next slide, please. And I just wanted to show a couple examples of what the 2D murals will look like. Um, this currently is an auto zone on Crenshaw Boulevard. You'll see the construction fencing uh, of the Metro project to the left. Um, but we look at this as an opportunity to show how the existing properties can actually be seen uh, with different art opportunities on them. So we present this to uh, landowners and say, you know, would you like to participate in this? And then from this process, after having them agree, we go to different artists in the community with the opportunity and they actually come through and present their ideas and proposals. We put it on existing buildings and then we actually talk about it from that point. So at no point um, it, will we create something that the community is not aware of uh, and the community is not in agreement. Next slide. And this is just another example of a business that's that's on the corridor. It's F and J Liquor, um, and it had you know different opportunities that were kind of like window sills, right? Um, and you know our curatorial committee said, wouldn't it be great to have these different kind of iterations of of black women and black life uh, on the on this storefront to really bring it uh, to life? Um, and and you know I just point out that this is you know again another opportunity that if you have artists in the room you will never be surprised uh, of what they come up with. And, and next slide, please. And then, like I said, there's also going to be uh, digital opportunities uh, through our wayfinding signage and in in a construction fences. And, and we think that this is an opportunity to really make sure that we fold in some of our digital artists, as well as our early and mid-career artists, uh, to make sure that they're along this process. So this 
grows our commissions by the hundreds. Um, and it also creates a programming opportunity for Destination Crenshaw, the nonprofit, which I'm very excited about. Uh, partnerships with schools, uh, art schools, art universities uh, that are in the LA area, thinking about ways that we can incorporate different people into the project to make sure that we're constantly evolving uh, the community uh, through this process and being able to show the different iterations of what art can do. Uh, so we're very, very, very excited about this happening. Next slide, please. And so this is just a short video uh, showing just um, a, a kind of motion walkthrough of, of what the corridor is eventually going to look like, um, so to speak. Um, and we'll see, we'll see if this video is able to be played. Looks like we're having some difficulties. Okay, no worries. We can just go to the next slide, and, and I'll make sure to I'll make sure to share uh, a version of that video uh, with everyone. Um, and and lastly, to talk about COVID response, um, we really believe that the Destination Crenshaw project, um, you know, even though we have a large art component, we do uh, center ourselves as a response for the the community at large. Um, so that is our small businesses, that is our residents, that is our artists. Um, so we see this uh, Public Arts Commission's process as a way to kind of fuel the Black artists and the creative economy in the corridor. Um, and, and we're very excited about, you know, accessing some state funding that's potentially available in California, as well as federal funding opportunities, you know, thinking about the Art Town grant. Uh, that we heard about today, as well as partnerships. Uh, you know, there, there are ways that nonprofits uh, can work with public entities to really push forward and drive some of these efforts. So we're really excited about different, different partnerships. Uh, speaking of Bank of America, who has supported our mini murals process um, and being able to provide us funding to be able to get uh, commissions and stipends out to our community artists uh, to respond during this time. So just really appreciate the opportunity to share this component of the larger Destination Crenshaw project and look forward to questions in the panel in the, in the future. Thanks so much, Jason. Appreciate that presentation. Sorry, we can get the video to work, but we will share it with everyone just a little bit. Um, we're running low on time anyhow, so I guess we should keep moving. Um, I just want to quickly say before Mikey and Kara, you jump in that it's a little bit unusual for us as a national organization to have two projects highlighted from the great state of California, or from any one singular state. Um, there aren't any really good reasons why we did it this time, except to say that uh, these are two really different projects at different stages and what they've accomplished in very demographically different places, not super far as far as the uh, crow flies, but rural community versus a neighborhood in, in LA. So I wanted to give everyone an understanding that this work plays out really, really differently, even in places that are pretty close together. Um, and much of this work is about responding to transportation infrastructure that came in in perhaps an inequitable way. Sometimes it's about driving the creation of transportation infrastructure. So there's lots of different ways to impact this work, different stages. I'll be quiet now and let Mikey and Kara talk about the great work they've been doing in Mariposa County in rural California. With that, please take it away. Can everybody hear me now? Yeah, sorry about that. Um, yeah, thank you so much, Ben, and uh, thanks for um, that. That intro is like five minutes of what I was going to say in about thirty seconds. So uh, thanks for making that distinction. I think uh, it 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 was really incredible and inspiring to hear the last presentation from Jason and then realize that we're in the same state. Except for we may as well, in some ways, not be. Um, like Ben said. Uh, Kara and I represent uh, a, a rural community in the Sierra Foothills. Um, the in population of our entire county is 20,000 people, which I would gather is maybe a census block uh, in, in LA. So um, our, our situation and our context are, are super different, but um, I think you'll probably hopefully uh, pick up on some of the similarities between uh, certainly our approach uh, and, and hopefully um, some of the outcomes of our project. Uh, which is the uh, Mariposa Creek Parkway, which um, you're hopefully looking at an image of right now. Um, this, uh, so this is the town of Mariposa, and I think maybe this gives you a sense of the scale of our, our county. Um, the 
urban grid that you see there is the, the entirety of the urban grid in the town of Mariposa, which is the county seat and the biggest town um, in our county. Uh, the Creek Parkway is a, a, what we're calling a, a class one multi-use trail that has kind of been um, on the apple of individuals' eyes in the county of Mariposa uh, and in the town of Mariposa since the early 1980s um, and has always just been this 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 it's always been assumed to be a nice little trail that uh, Mariposans can go on leisurely strolls uh, along um, Mariposa Creek, which is a perennial stream in um, in our town, uh, from the county fairgrounds up to the point where the creek terminates uh, or at least crosses under in a huge culvert um, at Highway 49. Um, but uh, over the intervening 40 or so years, um, our county and certainly uh, leaders within our county, including uh, individuals from the Mariposa County Arts Council, which Kara represents, uh, the Mariposa County Planning Department, which I represent, uh, and a number of other nonprofit partners began uh, to talk about uh, the Creek Parkway's potential um, to not only provide a nice place to walk, which hopefully it, it will and, and it does and will, but also to serve um, much more kind of significant um, community building initiatives related to uh, storytelling, climate change adaptation and resiliency, uh, and also um, these themes, which Jason had hinted at, uh, about cultural erasure and the, the way that we um, kind of describe and, and market ourselves to ourselves, but also to visitors. Uh, it's worth pointing out that uh, Mariposa uh, is the one of the gateway communities to Yosemite National Park, and our tiny community of 2,000 people in the town of Mariposa experiences huge seasonal fluctuations. We have over a million annual visitors who uh, come to the, the come to town to uh, to go to the park afterwards. So. Um, our interest in the last couple of years has been in sort of trying to think through how um, this project can knit together all those different threads and um, transportation, of course, being one of them, but these larger community building initiatives being um, at least as, uh, if not in some cases, even more so uh, important. And so how do we do that? And I don't know if you can actually see my screen because it's just white right now. Mm. Can you see my screen? It's just white. Yeah, close this and reopen it. Um, so I guess I'll just, hopefully this works. But uh, what I'm trying to show is the way that we did that was um, so so uh, part of that includes art. Part of that includes art, both physically uh, or both in the, the sort of planned or design phase, but also in the planning and design phase. So um, we hired an artist and a designer to help us ask those questions and get the community's direction and guidance on. Um, how we can, you know, sort of pursue this multi-beneficial, multidisciplinary uh, Creek Parkway project, and and reimagine the Creek Parkway as being much more than just this path that people can leisurely walk upon. So, uh, in the in the planning phase, art was a really crucial part. So we uh, designed this pop-up kind of space that we called the gatehouse that is located along Mariposa Creek, um, and we programmed that space uh, with a variety of different activities. Um, for a week, this was part of a larger community planning initiative, but um, for one week, Creek Week, uh, we had this facility, this temporary pop-up um, space up along Mariposa Creek, and we invited people uh, and encouraged and incentivized people to um, to come down to the creek to um, to see it and to hang out. We had um, you know uh, live music and like beer from the local brewery. We had uh, educational programming with the high school and the middle schoolers. We had a public health fair. And all throughout this entirety of this event, we had these opportunities for people to hang out and um, and share their thoughts and their input on the project and got input from um, a really diverse, wide range of people, which is atypical for our community or has traditionally been atypical. We're very much uh, one of these places, these communities where you know community engagement takes place between the hours of 5 and 6.30 on a weeknight at the library or the gym. Uh, and really tends to attract a, a very kind of limited or, or narrow demographic. But through this artist-led uh, creative or uh, community design effort, we are able to get input from a lot more uh, people in a, a plan, um, the Mariposa Creek Parkway Master Plan, which represents a, a much sort of more diverse and inclusive and um, uh, comprehensive vision um, of what the Mariposa Creek Parkway can be and how our project can achieve this sort of wider variety of community benefits. Um, and among those are uh, this concept of um, ecological restoration, in particular ecological restoration 
um, led by and centering traditional ecological knowledge and the practices of our local indigenous community, um, Southern Sierra Miwok Nation, uh, who have historically um, been erased from the entire county, but in particular, this area, the Mariposa Creek Corridor, has uh, historically been um, a, a critical kind of uh, location for indigenous people, including the Southern Sierra Miwok. Uh, and who were pushed aside for the California Gold Rush or through the California Gold Rush. Um, and so the sort of restoration of the creek, uh, and, and you can see here some you know, rendering of uh, restored native creek planting, but also access to the creek, um, and, and uh, educational signage and interpretive elements that are bilingual in English and in Miwok are ways of both um, promoting and helping to restore uh, a healthy native landscape, which is uh, worth mentioning resilience to climate change. Mariposa County is like much of California, but certainly the rest of the foothills, a highly combustible area and grappling with uh, this climate impact is certainly a, a focus of our project, but also to help restore and center again, um, uh, the Southern Sierra Miwok Nation and, and their practices as an integral part of our county, our community and, and our sense of place. Um, and to promote activities and opportunities for them to uh, reconnect to or, or harvest, um, or gather, or process um, those restored, the, the restored native landscape. And we'll talk a little bit more about that in a moment. Um, also though, I mean, again, it, given that this is such an integral class one bikeway and transportation resource, um, we're also thinking, we're, we're simultaneously thinking about how um, the Creek Parkway can be this, this critical connector, not just a place that people can, you know, walk through and, and and daydream about, which is really nice and important feature too. But um, how can this feature, how can this investment provide um, ADA accessible uh, active transportation connections to destinations for employment, uh, for cultural purposes, and also for um, public health uh, reasons. So not only uh, in terms of encouraging people to have more active lifestyles, but also to connect them to uh, health resources like medical clinics um, and our, our Health and Human Services Agency, which is served by this feature. And you're looking here at a really uh, steep, kind of difficult, um, uh, weird space that is uh, kind of historically has been forgotten and, and bypassed, but uh, reimagined here as, a, a, again, an ADA accessible active transportation link uh, for, for uh, bicycle and pedestrian users. And it's another I guess we'll probably cruise through here, but again, another cool picture for how we're, um, how this art driven process provided an opportunity for uh, us to express and, and co-create or co-imagine um, spaces that support uh, new art and new design elements. So you're looking here at this new patio space that um, you know supports or encourages people to, um, uh, to, to look at and admire Mariposa Creek, but also um, support uh, art elements that uh, Carol will talk more about in a moment that um, that relate to and in some cases even enhance uh, the Mariposa Creek Corridor. Um, but beyond just this sort of uh, you know conceptual or schematic level, our master plan also articulates this really specific and detailed um, vision for actually like implementing this class one bikeway and creating a new or class one multi-use trail for bike, bicycle and pedestrian usage. Uh, ADA compliant bicycle and pedestrian usage. So um, through this sort of you know technical and, and detailed exploration of what you know takes place and and, and what Mariposa Creek Park the Mariposa Creek Parkway can uh, support, we're able to you know take our plan and and our uh, the, the the effort that went into developing it uh, to the state of California and generate quite a bit of revenue to support it. We recently received uh, 4.6 million dollars through the Active Transportation Program to build essentially what you saw in uh, these colorful drawings um, based on sort of the, the compelling and, and comprehensive and art driven um, aspect of our project. Um, in addition to that $4.6 million, we also uh, generated revenue to support the development of a countywide creative placemaking strategy that incorporates uh, and relies heavily upon many of the themes um, that are covered uh, in, in the Creek Parkway Master Plan. And, and I'll let Kara talk to you a little bit about that. All right, thank you, Mikey. Um, can ever can you hear me? Okay, awesome. Thank you. Yeah, so as Mikey was saying, we've been deep into planning projects here in Mariposa um, that do sp support active transportation, specifically along the Creek Parkway. Um, and as he alluded to, the creative placemaking strategy that we're currently working on right now 
um, supports a lot of the things that he just addressed, um, but also um, addresses the need for cultural policy and a public desire for a more robust creative placemaking portfolio in Mariposa, which we don't currently have. We have no cultural policy at the moment. So in 2018, and the planning department and the arts council started putting the pieces to together to develop a creative placemaking strategy that could identify priority public art and creative placemaking projects, programs, and policy for the county. And knowing that we wanted this plan to be authentically informed and guided by solid input and feedback from Mariposans and people who love and frequent Mariposa. And riffing on the success of Creek Week, we landed on the idea that we would use demonstration creative placemaking projects as a means to um, collect stakeholder engagement data that we, um, yeah, so, so we would use art projects to collect data. Um, and to do this, we received an Art Town grant from the National Endowment from the Arts that Jen was talking about earlier to put these demonstration projects together. We knew these pro we wanted these projects to be participatory and representative and represent Mariposans. And given the very social nature of our community, um, we thought we would use these projects uh, to bring people together and we would collect narrative feedback and conversations and or with conversations and oral interviews. But right as we were beginning to develop all these in-person creative placemaking programs, COVID dropped. And so no to all of that. But fortunately, we're an agile crew and we were able to quickly develop three different projects that were COVID friendly, but managed to still hit the participatory, representative and resonant marks we were aiming for. So the first one is this must be the place. And it was a participatory photography project that prompted residents to share photos of the places and events that make the community special. Community members were asked to share just one photo of a cherished place, favorite event, or a personal or intimate depiction of Mariposa County, but they needed to be in the photograph or someone needed to be in the photograph. Basically, we wanted to create a photo album of the community. Um, and while they were sharing the image, we also wanted a small caption from them that kind of explained the importance of the image or the place that they were depicting as well as some basic demographic information about them. But as the pandemic became just increasingly more difficult, this project provided the community members with an opportunity to reflect on and safely share thoughts and experiences and local resources that they treasured. So it kind of started to have this a little bit of a life of its own beyond just the data we were trying to collect, um, which is great. Let's see, but at the end, we were able to, the results of this, um, oh, let me see, upon, now I want to keep it here for a second. Um, so when we got the submissions, we were able to code them and determine what kind of local assets um, Mariposans truly embraced. And we also, yeah, so that gave us a lot of insight on what people liked as um, is probably not surprisingly, I think 90% of people identified that they wanted to be outside and 40% said that they uh, treasured Mariposa's trails. So speaking again to um, transportation issues being of importance, you know, worth investing in here in Mariposa. Uh, while this must be the place gave us some great information about what people liked, it we needed more details about the specific projects and um, programs and policies uh, people wanted in, in terms of our stakeholder engagement. So we developed two additional demonstration projects to and uh, um, an online survey that we could use to collect this information and these projects would draw people to the survey. And they are situated along the Mariposa Creek Parkway. First one is Seed Share. And so this, with this installation, we wanted to create something that responded to the key prevailing themes and threads captured in this must be the place, um, especially the notion that landscapes and native species and natural processes that occur throughout the Sierra Foothills and the high country are um, really important fundamental components of why Mariposans value this place. Um, and in the context of climate change, which alters and has been destabilizing a lot of native ecosystems, it's been increasingly vital for Mariposans to, who, who are feeling attached to this landscape to act as stewards as it. And stewardship, as Mikey um, alluded in or talked about earlier, is a really, um, is something that uh, we're really leaning into as a county with the restoration of the Creek Parkway and using traditional ecological knowledge to um, restore the parkway to its like indigenous landscape. 
And SeedShare is this installation that um, uh, basically invites people to take free seeds of a native plants, plant them and create, plant them on their own properties or around and create migratory corridors for pollinators um, to help kind of reestablish and support our native ecosystems. All right. And then here you can also see that with at the seed share is an invitation to, to um, participate in the online survey. And then kind of one of our maybe the biggest showstopper piece that we created um, through this process was entitled Aloma. And as Mikey stated earlier, the Southern Sierra Miwok are our indigenous people. Um, they're native to the Mariposa, to Mariposa County and Yosemite National Park and have um, been you know, have a long history of experiencing violence, brutality, and erasure by non-native peoples, including the state and federal government. Um, they're still not federally, are still not federally a federally recognized tribe. Um, however, their histories and contemporary experience and many of the future um, and what kind of they are here today is left fully unexplored by the county's creative placemaking portfolio. And the few depictions that you might see of Southern Sierra Miwok in our public art were conceived of by non-Indigenous um, people with little or no consultation from the Southern Sierra Miwok. So as we were developing this plan, it became quite apparent to everyone involved that this was an opportunity to address these injustices, um, specifically with recommendations in the plan, but also within the demonstration projects we were putting together. So we worked with the Southern Sierra Miwok and our um, and a local contractor to develop an installation that we've entitled that's entitled Alama, which means basket in Miwok. And it uses it, it, it basically it's a, a it's a it speaks to co-fabrication, intergenerational learning, um, the resources that the Southern Sierra Miwok people would have found along the Creek Parkway when it was at its like most uh, when it was in its indigenous state and the resources that they would use then to create um, baskets or use in other cultural practices. And so you'll see here that we've got a group of people working to create baskets. The lady in front um, is Sandra Chapman and she kind of created this whole experience for everyone. And it was an opportunity for members of the tribe to come and learn how to create baskets, um, which was something that they hadn't had an opportunity to do. And then Mikey, if you wanna switch the slide. Oh, maybe we won't see the installation. Oh, here we go. And then it resulted in these two pieces of artwork on either side of a bridge crossing Mariposa Creek um, that was really kind of conceived and developed by the Southern Sierra Miwok. It demonstrates the things they want to share. It speaks to the um, resources that are found along the Creek Parkway. The signage is in both Miwok and in English, and, and it speaks to all the plants that, that have been utilized in the process and that should or can be found along the Creek Parkway. Um, so yeah, and then it also invites people, uh, everyone in the community to um, participate in the online survey to tell us more about what kind of creative placemaking projects they would like to see in Mariposa. And just like Mikey shared with the Creek Parkway master plan, the creative placemaking strategy has been generative in its own way um, and kind of riffing off or building off of these projects we submitted an application to the California Arts Council's Innovation and Intersections grant program to create additional artistic interventions along the Creek Parkway that would support traditional ecological knowledge, that would be uh, would center Southern Sierra Miwok um, narratives and um, serve to better represent them in our community. And then also to help develop more trails for active transportation. And we were successfully awarded that grant. And so over the next three years, we're gonna see along the Creek Parkway, we're gonna see a number of very significant public art installations going in to support all that work. And that's about it. Thank you, Kara. Thank you, Mikey, for that presentation. Um, 
as you all are probably not surprised to hear, we've gone a few minutes over. I'm sure you've noticed. Um, I'm really excited and impressed that so many of you, almost all of you, have stayed a few minutes late. Um, I sort of predicted this would happen. We're not going to have a chance to answer all the great questions that have come in, but we will answer them and post them when we post the uh, the summary of this webinar and the video of the webinar. So stay tuned for that. Um, that's also a reminder: if you have any questions, type them in right now, and they'll be recorded here, and we'll get a chance to answer them in just a second. Um, I'm sorry we didn't have more time to go into even more detail on those two wonderful projects. They're both really complex, multi-year complex uh, projects involving lots of different partners. If only there was a website you could go to to find more information on those projects and projects like that. Um, just kidding. Transportation.r, you can find both Destination Crenshaw and all the work you just heard about in Mariposa summarized there, as well as many other similar projects. You can read all about them on our website. Um, last thing I want to mention before we do wrap up, and again, sorry we're going so late, is that I, I've been scrolling through the names of the people who are on our webinar live right now. Lots of familiar names there. Great to see you all. If any of you see any of you familiar and are featured on um, the scenic route, transportation.art, see anything that you think is incorrect or like so many projects has been updated, new uh, victories have been won, new parts of the project have launched, please let us know. We see this as a living website. One of the great things about having a website versus a PDF or a report is that we can actually go in and update things, new photos, new text, things of that nature. So we'd love to hear from you if that's the case. And then at the same time, those of you who are not familiar to me, who I, I don't know yet, I'd um, love to hear from you as well. I'm sure many of you are working on really great, similar kinds of projects at the intersection of art, culture, and transportation. Uh, we feature, like I've said, uh, many of our own projects and projects we've been involved with. We love to hear about other great things that are happening out there. And despite our best efforts, never know absolutely 100% of what's happening across the country. So we rely on folks like you to let us know about the great work you're doing. So love to hear from you. Um, we're working on a few more webinars in the near future, some of which will be conversational, some of which will highlight other sections of the the scenic route and some of the other projects we're working on so stay tuned for that get on our mailing list if you aren't already and with that i will wrap things up and just thank all of our speakers one more time thank you to the nea again for funding this project and thank you to all of you for joining us today hope to stay in touch thanks and bye